CE hopeful John Lee visits Nanoflat residents and ethnic minorities as part of his election campaign. 429 new COVID-19 cases in the city. And Ukraine residents set President set to meet the U.S. Secretary of State and Defense Secretary in Kyiv later today. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Chief Executive hopeful John Lee made his first visit to the city's marginalized communities since his election bid was announced two weeks ago. That's after days of campaign stops with election committee members and business leaders to lobby for their support and nominations. Today, he says boosting housing supply will be front and center in his policies if he is elected. It's the first trip to the city's poorest and most vulnerable by John Lee as a chief executive hopeful and a sole contender for the city's top job. In Yaoma, he visited a single mother living in a nano flat and a granny residing in an even smaller home of 40 square feet, which is around one third the size of a car parking space. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. The next stop, an exchange with representatives of new immigrants and ethnic minorities. Each and every time when I come to a place where I can meet people from different backgrounds, different ethnicity, I find it is the most precious time for learning and for making Hong Kong a better place to live. There, Lee says tackling housing woes would hold the key to resolving multiple issues in Hong Kong. With that, Lee says improving cross-departmental coordination to speed up housing projects would be on his policy platform. On press freedom, Lee says it's important, but there's no need to defend it, stressing such freedoms should come within the bounds of the law. With details of his election manifesto mostly ironed out, Lee says the manifesto will be out within the coming week. On a radio program, two of Lee's campaign office members, former Security Secretary Lai Tong Kwok and former Police Commissioner Tang King Shing say priority for the next administration should be on the pandemic and border reopening. Lai also called for the introduction of a National Security Education Commissioner to oversee the promotion of security-related issues because the once-a-year National Security Education Day is not enough. Both Lai and Tang are also members of the 1,500-strong election committee, which will ultimately decide if Lee will succeed Carrie Lam as the city's leader on May 8th. The city has reported some 400 new COVID-19 cases, down from more than 500 reported yesterday. Most of the new infections were locally transmitted. However, the authorities are on the lookout for a possible rebound, as most primary schools will resume half-day in-person classes tomorrow. Kev Long has more details. The city's daily COVID case counts remain on a steady decline. Today, 429 new cases were reported. All but 19 cases were locally transmitted cases. Among the 410 local cases, half were identified through nucleic acid tests, while the others tested positive using rapid antigen tests. As for the 19 imported cases, 15 tested positive upon their arrival at the airport, including four passengers on board Asiana Airlines Flight OZ-745 and five Qatar Airways Flight QR-818 passengers. These two flights will be suspended from landing in the city for seven days. Meanwhile, 13 more COVID patients aged between 31 and 89 died at public hospitals. So far, the fifth wave of COVID-19 has claimed 9,036 lives. Even though the city's primary schools were given the green light to resume half-day in-person classes last week, more than 500 schools have opted to reopen their campus tomorrow instead. As students will once again be gathering in schools, there will be associated health risks. Currently, 65% um, of children aged 3 to 11 receive one dose, and this is certainly um, not high enough. For children who are infected, if they are unvaccinated, they could be more likely to experience some serious consequences, such as admission into ICUs. The authorities are also on the lookout for a possible rebound in COVID infections after the Easter long weekend, following the loosening of some social distancing measures. Kate Bloom, TVB News. 
The Hong Kong College of Physicians has warned that unvaccinated seniors over 60 years old are 21 times more likely to die from Omicron than their vaccinated counterparts. The group says more than 300,000 seniors in Hong Kong have contracted COVID. Among them, more than 8,000 died. Chao Kai Ming is one of the doctors in the group. He described how he witnessed an elderly COVID patient who couldn't even blow the candles on the birthday cake for her 70th birthday. That's because she was all tethered up with oxygen masks. That was her last birthday, he says. The group also says one in every five unvaccinated elderly COVID patients suffers from long COVID symptoms and has to be readmitted to hospital. With that, the group urges the 350,000 unvaccinated seniors to get the jab as soon as possible before the next wave of outbreaks hits. A professor at the University of Hong Kong's Faculty of Medicine believes the fifth wave of COVID-19 infections has led to the buildup of natural immunity among many local residents. He also thinks the loosening of social distancing measures can be accelerated, but says achieving zero infection will be a difficult task. Timothy Lee has more. Daily COVID-19 cases in the city remain in the hundreds, and the epidemic seems to show no rebound one week after the Easter long weekend. Clinical professor Ivan Hung at the University of Hong Kong's Department of Medicine spoke to TVB News about how local residents acquired natural immunity can help loosen social distancing measures. The social distancing uh, maybe <clears throat> we could maintain for uh, a few more months uh, in terms of the uh, you know, uh, restaurant facilities or indoor activities. Uh, however, uh, for outdoor activities, as I've said, is, is extremely safe to take off the mask. So maybe I think we could move out of the phase one into phase two a little bit quicker, uh, given that we have already have a, many people have been infected already with a very high natural immunity. Starting on May 1st, Hong Kong will reopen to non-residents and ease flight suspension rules. Hong suggests the tracking of new arrivals should be strengthened after they have finished their seven-day hotel quarantine. But many are concerned whether a wide-ranging relaxation of anti-COVID measures will allow the city to achieve zero infection and how it will affect the feasibility of quarantine-free travel to the mainland. Even if we talk about dynamic zero is not actually actual zero, it's actually of, you know, containing uh, the virus, minimizing the number of, you know, uh, severe cases and, and death. So I think if we're able to contain the virus to a very small numbers, uh, and that, of course, uh, with a very high vaccination rate, uh, which I'm sure that even in mainland, the, the policy will gradually change as the vaccination rate has come up, uh, go up in, in, in China as well. Then by that time, I'm sure that there will be no problem of, you know, uh, opening up between Hong Kong and, and China and also to the rest of the world. He believes the city's daily infection numbers will remain in double digits for the foreseeable future and that a mandatory citywide testing is unnecessary and not cost effective. He says in view of the Omicron variant's high transmissibility, we may be able to achieve zero infection, but only for a few days. Timothy Lee, TVB News. The mainland reported around 21,800 new COVID infections. More than 20,000 hail from Shanghai, where authorities have hardened a strict zero COVID approach. This as volunteers and low-level government staff work to seal off the city's high-risk neighborhoods, sparking anger among some residents. In this video widely circulated online, scuffles broke out between security guards and residents after some tried to tear down the barricade at the entrance. This has Shanghai locked 39 more COVID-related fatalities. Since the outbreaks began there two months ago, fewer than 100 deaths were registered. An investigation by the Associated Press found there's likely an undercount of the true death toll due to recent changes in the ways to count positive cases, which led to wiggle room in how authorities arrive at the final death toll. This, as Liang Wanian, head of the National Health Commission, stressed today that China has no room to relax social distancing rules for now. He warned that lying flat or letting the pandemic take its course will only end disastrously, with the country's most vulnerable bearing the brunt of it. Overseas, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin are due in Kyiv Sunday to discuss Ukraine's request for more powerful weapons. This as Russia resumed its attack on the Azov-style steelworks in Mariupol and continued their offensive in the east as well as Kharkiv in the northeast. Matthew Bray reports. 
In a dramatic Saturday night news conference in an underground metro station, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky told hundreds of media that he would discuss with American officials the exact list of weapons needed and the pace of deliveries. He went on to say that Ukraine would quit any talks with Moscow if Russian forces killed the defenders in Mariupol. And he fought back tears at one point, saying he shared the pain of all Ukrainians who had lost children in Russia's war. He had footage of the Azov-style steel plant with the familiar Z forces of Russian tanks apparently mopping up Ukrainian resistance. And here is further footage of a thousand civilians sheltering in the complex with remaining Ukraine fighters. Some of the people have been here since February. We want to see peaceful skies, we want to breathe fresh air, said this trapped Mariupol resident. A totally different version of events naturally from the Russian side, Igor Konashenkov, the defence spokesman, said Mariupol is normalised. Residents are free to move without hiding from shelling of Ukrainian Nazis and humanitarian aid is being delivered. Residents of Kharkiv are still fending off Russian bombardment too. Three people were killed here and seven wounded in the city northwest of Donbass on Saturday. They don't give us peace or quiet even on the holidays, said one distraught resident referring to the Orthodox Easter. Matthew Bray, TVB News. Russian President Vladimir Putin has attended an Easter Mass conducted by the Russian Orthodox Church, which has strongly backed the so-called special military operation in Ukraine. The service held on Saturday night saw Putin along with the Moscow mayor, Sergei Sobyanin, holding lit red candles. The head of the Orthodox Church, Patriarch Kirill, officiated the service. Kirill said he hoped the conflict would end quickly but did not condemn it. His statements have splintered the worldwide Orthodox Church. Putin did not speak during the service other than to say, truly he is risen, in response to the Patriarch saying, Christ has risen, along with the rest of the congregation. Ten people have been confirmed dead after a Japanese tour boat with 26 people on board went missing yesterday off the country's northern coast. The search for the others is still ongoing. Authorities are using aircraft and pet patrol boats in the search and rescue operation. The tour boat was carrying 24 passengers, including two children and two crew members during the cruise. The boat reportedly ran into trouble off Shiletoko Peninsula, famous for its wildlife and dramatic coastline. The transport ministry has launched an investigation into the operator over its safety standards and its decision to conduct a tour despite rough weather. Experts suspect the boat ran aground and was damaged in an area known for strong currents and a rocky coastline. The cold temperature and strong wind could cause hypothermia, reducing the passengers' chance of survival. Japan said it would bolster its military strength to help the United States maintain regional security. The remark was made by Minister of Foreign Affairs Yoshimasa Hayashi during a visit yesterday to a U.S. aircraft carrier patrolling Asian waters. Hayashi's comments came amid concern in Japan that Russia's invasion of Ukraine could encourage Beijing to use military force to win control of Taiwan and threaten nearby Japanese islands. Tokyo has also expressed concerns about Beijing's deepening security ties with Moscow. That includes their joint drills in waters surrounding Japan. China has said its intentions in Asia are peaceful. Still ahead. Voting in the French presidential runoff election now underway. Police arrest a suspected arsonist in connection with an early morning fire in Sha Tin that leaves six people injured. And newly developed makeshift isolation facilities for residential care homes. Welcome back. Voting in France's presidential runoff election has got underway. Incumbent leader Emmanuel Macron is facing off against his right-wing challenger, Marine Le Pen, as he seeks his second five-year term in office. Danny Rao tells us more. The French public have 12 hours to cast their votes in Sunday's presidential runoff election. They will decide whether to keep the centrist pro-EU Emmanuel Macron in power or hand over the reins of the country to right-wing Brussels critic Marine Le Pen. 
Recent opinion polls have largely shown Macron holds a solid lead in the race, as he bids to become the first French president in 20 years to win a second term. The incumbent leader has pledged to virtually eradicate unemployment in France should he be re-elected. The national jobless rate has already decreased during his current term to its lowest level in a generation. Macron also wants to progressively raise the retirement age from 62 to 65, increase the minimum monthly pension, in addition to raising the salaries of teachers. Furthermore, he has proposed that companies should be able to give employees an untaxed bonus of 6,000 euros, as well as putting caps on energy bills. Macron has criticized many of Le Pen's policies, particularly one that would ban Muslim women from wearing headscarves in public. Some analysts believe Le Pen's attempts to rebrand the image of her National Rally Party may not quite be enough to win over the electorate. She has centered her campaign around reducing France's rising cost of living, with the nation having been hard hit by a global surge in energy prices. Le Pen has rebuffed accusations of racism over her plans to give priority to French citizens for social housing and jobs, as well as scrapping certain welfare benefits for foreigners. She said these policies would benefit all French citizens, regardless of their religion or origins. Le Pen, who is aiming to become France's first ever female president, has also criticized Macron's public persona, arguing he is an elitist who is out of touch with ordinary French people. Pollsters speculate that both Macron and Le Pen will need to win over voters from outside their usual support bases in order to guarantee election. Whoever emerges victorious will still need to make gains in June's parliamentary elections in order to secure a platform to implement their keystone policies. Daniel Rowe, TVB News. Back locally, six people were injured in an early morning fi fire in Sha Tin, with the police arresting a suspected arsonist. The fire began at 2 a.m. in a housing unit on the 19th floor of Feng Wai House at Sun Tin Wai Estate. Firefighters forcibly entered the unit to rescue a 76-year-old woman and a 28-year-old man. Both were unconscious and in critical condition. Another three individuals affected by the blaze, including a six-month-old infant girl, were sent to the Prince of Wales Hospital. The suspected arsonist, a 57-year-old man, was arrested in the building stairwell. Police found that he was carrying two knives. Around 400 residents had to be evacuated from their homes during the fire. Firefighters put out the blaze after about an hour. A woman has been arrested in North Point in connection with the death of a 19-month-old toddler. Police received a report the baby girl and the woman had collapsed in a flat on Kings Road Saturday night. With neck injuries, the toddler was believed to have been strangled. The 24-year-old woman in the apartment also sustained neck injuries and was, con was conscious while being sent to hospital. Suicide notes and plastic cords were found in the unit. The woman has been detained for further investigations. The company has developed a set of equipment for residential care homes to set up makeshift isolation facilities at their own locations. Each unit is composed of a cubicle covered with plastic film and installed with air filtration and sterilization machines. The inventor said these isolation units can achieve up to 21 air changes per hour and are able to kill 99.98% of the virus in the air. The units are for care homes to provide temporary isolation for residents who contracted COVID before they are sent to a hospital. The units will be tested in seven care homes for two weeks. Carnival came back to Rio de Janeiro in style with colorful floats and flamboyant dancers packing the streets as well as the iconic Samba Drum. Rio's top Samba schools began strutting their staff stuff from Thursday onwards, the first evening of a three-night spectacle. Entire communities rally around the competing Samba schools, whose shows are not only a source of pride but employment as they require months of rehearsals. As well as the parades, many impromptu parties spring up all over the city. The carnival is not quite on the scale of previous ones, but was more than enough for most revelers after two years of cancelled events. Thank you for watching.